Anyone familiar with me would be able to tell you that I like Xenoblade, and this is kind of all-encompassing. There are so many things I absolutely adore about these games. I think, however, if I had to choose one aspect that I love above anything else, it'd probably be the narratives. Funny misdirect aside, the music of these games would definitely be second, and wouldn't you know it, both of these things are fundamentally intertwined with what I'm going to be discussing here. Personally, both Xenoblade 2 and 3 are easily in my top 3 favourite soundtracks ever, and Xenoblade 1 and X are probably at least top 5. Point is, I love Xenoblade music. It's not just that the songs are extremely good, but also about how they are interwoven into story and gameplay, and how the musical expression of the songs themselves help to tell a story. A perfect example of this would be one of my favourite tracks ever created for this series, Xenoblade 3's Carrying the Weight of Life, an emotionally driven song that provides me with free serotonin whenever I listen to it. Seriously, if you somehow ended up here without having heard this song before, please go give it a listen. And let it inspire you to then play Xenoblade 3, please, 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 it's really good, it's really good, I promise. Furthermore, this video will contain significant spoilers for Xenoblade 3. Unfortunately, that makes the video a little bit inaccessible, but it is kind of unavoidable. So basically, play Xenoblade 3. Also, if you don't know who I am, hi, I'm Layla. I like Xenoblade, I like video games as a whole, and I like discussing them, so that's what we're going to be doing here. So all that being said, let's explore why I think this song is so good, and what it represents within the wider narrative of the game. Fundamentally, the world of Xenoblade 3 is not a pleasant place to live. A world of ceaseless conflict, where death is a commonplace occurrence, spearheaded by Mobius, the ruling class who feast off of the lives consumed by the endless war, both figuratively, through how they treat this as entertainment, and literally harvesting the life essence of soldiers to prolong their own existence. From the narrative's outset, it's clear that reverence and respect for the lives of other people is not an easily achievable goal. Both Gavessi and Agnian soldiers are trained to see their opponents as less than human, as nothing but fuel for their own flame clocks, rejoicing in taking their lives if only because it allows them to live another day. It's important, then, that our dual protagonists, Noah and Mio, are both offseers from Kevis and Agnes respectively, flute players whose melodies memorialise and mourn their deceased comrades. This immediately provides us with a pair of characters who are inherently empathetic and enraptured in the lives of everyone who lives in their world, and, upon being freed from the war by becoming Ouroboros, commit themselves even further to honouring and treasuring the sanctity of life, both on a more personal level by sending off the departed, but also by fighting for a future in which everyone can be free to live their lives to the fullest. Life is a major theme in this game. Okay, sorry, that's a lot of preamble, but I feel it's important I set the stage. The world of Ionius does not engender respect for the lives of others by the fundamental nature of its being. It is a world of pointless cruelty and disregard for those who live in it, that, other than offseeing, can't meaningfully atone for the amount of death that is inflicted. Offseers being musical by design allows for both diegetic and non-diegetic representations of these themes and ideas to the characters and the audience, and these two often overlap, where the non-diegetic score is indicative of the same thoughts and feelings that are expressed in the diegetic flute melodies. As is stated in-game, the Offseer's melody is an embodiment of feelings in many ways, both of the player and the ones being played too. An Offseer's melody! It's more than a sequence of notes. It is shaped by feelings. Those of the player and of the ones being played for. You can easily look at any song that incorporates the flu and interpret how it relates to the in-universe concept of offseeing. There are tons of examples of this throughout the game. Noah, Mio, Miyabi, and Chris all have their own offseer melodies that represent and communicate their thoughts and ideas. The combination of Noah and Mio's melodies serving to represent their newfound harmony and congruent desire to forge a better future, as well as the determination and drive to fight past the overwhelming odds presented, purely because it being the right thing to do makes it worth fighting for no matter how unsure the situation is. This is what I believe carrying the weight of life is indicative of when it plays in-game, Ouroboros' desire to change the world for the better, and the conviction they feel that what they're doing is correct. For our first example of this, we need to examine the cutscene cutting down the flame clock, in which Noah and Mio destroy Colony 4's flame clock out of necessity, therefore discovering a new way to counter Mobius' dominance over the world. This scene as a whole is a microcosm for the game's climax, in which the party decides that a choice with an unclear outcome is preferable to a world of certainty, of Mobius' control and ever-present selfish desire to stay in frozen eternity, because Ionios is an unjust world, even if it's a safer option than the alternative. Destroying the flame clock and restoring the flow of time by activating Origin both carry the risk of killing everyone they are trying to save, but the party is faced with no other option than to surrender themselves to the whims of Mobius, where their lives are nothing but fodder. 
The party ultimately determines that even if there's risk involved, it's one they should take because it stands to create a better world for them all if successful, and they are right to do so. That kind of unknowable future can certainly be scary, but Xenoblade 3's thesis is that maintaining a safe present leads to inevitable decay and stagnation, where people cannot grow and evolve and change for the better. You taking the mic? It's terrifying! Not knowing how tomorrow will turn out! How you will! But still, you can't just hold it in place! If you did that, you'd never change! You can't change the world like that! That's why I want to move on! We'll claim the future, and shape it ourselves! Mobius's resistance to change and the Annihilation events both represent these ideas and pose a significant threat to life. This is why risks such as these are worth taking, and we can see this type of resolve in the party, especially in Noah and Mio, as early as this cutscene. This is only heightened further by the use of carrying the weight of life. Okay, so it's been like a whole lot of setup until now, but maybe we can actually start talking about the song itself. Also, I'm not super musically inclined, so I'm not going to be using a lot of technical terms, I might not be great at identifying instruments, and I will definitely miss some stuff, but I'll do my best. Anyway, this composition is genuinely one of the most impactful and emotionally resonant things I've ever experienced, and that's only reinforced by how it's used in this cutscene, like, oh my god, this shit slaps so hard. The song starts with slow, almost mournful violins that convey the melancholy and dire state of the world and the often perilous positions our protagonists are in. Quickly though, this is upended by a flurry of drums, piano and electric guitar that reinvigorate and energize the piece making it immediately feel more optimistic and upbeat, encompassing Ouroboros' resolve to persist and fight against the depressing state of the world. This of course coincides with an increase in tempo, which lends itself well to this idea. It also creates a sense of the mad scramble for survival that the group often feels, However, this confusion is quickly assuaged, as the party's resolve strengthens. After this intro though, the violins return and begin to harmonise with the piano, as if Ouroboros' will is already altering things for the better. We also get this lovely little acoustic guitar riff in the background. I don't have anything grandiose to interpret out of it, but I just wanted to mention it because it's a small thing that I think really adds to the feel of this section. We also get some brass instrumentation following this that serves to round out the piece, as if the party's beliefs are coalescing and reaffirming the reasons why they fight. Of course, we can see this reflected in the scene, where each pair now has access to their interlink and they can fight more effectively for their goals. Here, the song ascends, then descends a little, before heading all the way up into a climax. I think it's worth mentioning at this point that pre-release material discussing this song defined it as a moving song that expresses the emotions of Noah, Mio, and their friends as they fight their way through the world of Xenoblade Chronicles 3, and I think this is a fitting description. It's no more evident to me than in the song's chorus, where the intense chords and rhythmic driving drumbeat feel as though the group is pushing back against the world and forging their own path in its wake. At the end of each of these choruses, the melody is led by both the aforementioned brass and then later the electric guitar. I feel as though the former, with its relatively lower, longer expressions, represents a more subdued feeling, maybe more subconscious and innate that is motivating the party, as if they know on some fundamental level that what they are doing is the correct choice.
The electric guitar, on the other hand, feels more like a conscious motivator, being loud and expressive and confident. And this is a fun part, because following this we get two musical motifs that reference both Xenoblade 1 and 2 respectively. Chances are that you'll know about these already, it's fairly common knowledge, but just in case I'll show you both. So firstly we have a phrase from Xenoblade 1's Engage the Enemy. And secondly, a phrase from Xenoblade 2's counterattack. Incidentally, counterattack is my favorite song, just like ever. So this just makes me go, yeah, I love it. I love it so much. Notably, both of these songs serve similar purposes in their respective games, being the obligatory banger that plays during important story moments. Additionally, they also tend to embody strong feelings of conviction and determination, exhibited by the protagonists of those games, to fight for their own futures. I'm not going to go too deep on them here, but yes, they are both very good songs and I'm glad to have them incorporated into this song as well. The usage of both these motifs here is emblematic of how the future that Xenoblade 3 cast strives for is fueled by the same desire to create a better world that drove the casts of Xenoblade 1 and 2. And relevantly, it's also fitting that the world the Xenoblade 3 cast is fighting for is the continuation of the worlds of both of those prior games, so their goals align with their predecessors in multiple senses. This suggests that Ouroboros is inheriting their role in the world from both Shulk and Rex's parties, as what they have passed down musically is evocative of what they've passed down symbolically, the need to fight for the better world they know can be achieved. Following this, we get an isolated piano melody, preceded by a brief moment of silence. This moment feels reflective, as if the party is considering their previous actions and their options going ahead. That one moment in which they may feel doubtful or second-guess themselves. The same desire as Mobius to not push forward into the future that we all feel from time to time. We see this in the cutscene itself, Noah and Mia re-evaluating what they're doing, but pressing on regardless after their initial attempts seem fruitless. It will be okay. Noah and friends will set things right. Even armor of Veronis gets sliced to itsy bits. If it can really take a Veronis clean out, then maybe... Mio! Try again! And how else would this be depicted than with the introduction of a flute? In this moment, Noah and Mia's resolve, their roles as offseers serving as voices for the departed, and their connection to one another all meld into the same drive to continue on. On top of this, the flute also replaces where the violins were used in a similar segment earlier, reinforcing that their beliefs and actions have now surpassed Mobius and the world itself. They are no longer held back by its constraints, or weighed down by the tragedy the world has put upon them. None of that could undo their will to press on. This is even displayed in the cutscene itself, as Mobius K describes the flame clock as Therefore, Noah and Mio actually managing to destroy it portrays how their will to live is stronger than that of Mobius. Oh my god, I love metaphors which is why the music elevates this moment into being so victorious for the party. In addition to this, the presence and prominence of the flute at this part of the song connotes a deep sense of reverence for human life, as that's what Ouroboros is ultimately fighting for. The idea that everybody has a life deserving of respect that they should be able to live to its fullest, free from the unjust restrictions Mobius imposes for their own selfish gain. Not 
Not only does their music show respect for their fallen friends and allies, it also helps them carve a path forward for all lives to be respected in that same way, hence why it aligns with their efforts to stop Mobius. As much as this is signified in the music itself, it's also signposted in its very title. Ouroboros knows both the weight and sanctity of life, and Noah and Mio especially are carrying both the souls of the departed and the feelings of the living into a future that will be better for them all. We've come this far harboring everyone's hopes and dreams. And so, we would never stop now. Not when we've come so far. We won't lose to you. We'll fight for all the people alive. Their desires must build the bridge to the future. This, to me, is the quintessential example of the cohesion between music and narrative that Xenoblade 3 does so well. All the feelings and thoughts expressed in Offscene culminate and are expressed to the player through music, elevating the scene and establishing how Noah and Mio's resolve has grown. The way in which Offsea has expressed themselves and embody ideas in their music is paralleled by how the game's music communicates similar ideas to the audience, as if Noah and Mio are communicating with the player themselves. God, I wish they were, why aren't my scrunklies real? The connection here between diegetic and non-diegetic music is palpable. Making music an important part of the world building was such a smart idea, why is this game so good? Of course, this flute section corresponds with the moment in which our heroes finally succeed, cutting the flame clock, freeing Colony 4, and weakening Mobius all at once. Though the final part of the song doesn't actually play in this cutscene, it's important to note that the song ends with a triumphant roar of all the instruments together, reflecting the victory of our party. Now, I don't have quite as much to say about the song's usage in the cutscene Annihilation event, as many of the points I've made are relevant there as well, so I don't think they need restating. I would like to just briefly talk about why this cutscene also works well with this song. One thing I love is that Mobius, O, and P talk and act as if they are the heroes of their own story, going hard on the over-the-top self-aggrandizing and painting themselves as the ones who deserve to succeed, only to get their shit absolutely destroyed by Ouroboros. Not only is this entertaining, but it also re-establishes how the party's reason for fighting is justified and more righteous than Mobius's, as well as their wills being strong enough to withstand adversity, no matter how immense. Again, the song feeds into this, relaying how Ouroboros' fight for the future is strongly motivated and cannot be meaningfully silenced. Another thing I'd like to mention is how Noah and Mio's coordination here is backed up musically by the most flute-heavy section, mirroring how their shared history as Offseers and their newfound power as an interlink pair grants them an intimate bond that allows them to work very well in sync with each other. Mio! I'm on it! Huh? Mio, what are you? This is it! It's the only way! It's as if they're able to express their feelings to each other almost effortlessly now, communicating their plan to one another without even needing words. This kind of builds upon this moment from cutting down the flame clock. Then maybe... Mio! Mio. Try again! Cancel the interlink after we jump! What's the plan? Looks like the time's come! What are you talking about? Fire! Ready when you are! No. What are you... But here their teamwork is even more refined, and when considering their recent conversation at Tower Camp, it makes sense as they now understand each other better. I feel like we're starting to get on the same wavelength. Maybe interlinking just helped that along. To bring us a little closer together. Maybe, yeah. That might just be it. Also, this opening section where the action lines up with the music is just everything. I love it so much. Now, for future Redeem's use of this song, I want to highlight a constant across all three times the song plays. Sick as fuck coordinated attacks. All in sync! What? In sync! Let's go! If 
fangirling aside, the idea of harmonious camaraderie between what initially seemed to be disparate people is powerful. Ouroboros, the power to understand the past experiences and perspectives of others, the resonant teamwork that is born from that, and the shared will to then fight for the future, is pivotal in all of these moments, and connecting this through music serves to embellish that idea. Since this use of the song is pretty short, I don't have much else to talk about that hasn't already been mentioned. I do unfortunately have to lament that this song feels underutilized. Like, on the one hand I think it's cool because it makes the scenes it plays in very special, but I do also wish it got at least one more use. Now that I'm done discussing the song itself, there's one more thing I'd like to touch on. Another song in Xenoblade 3's soundtrack that is, in essence, a companion piece to carrying the weight of life. And that would be words that never reached you. In title alone, the song immediately presents a juxtaposition. If Offseers communicate their ideas through music, and Ouroboros' ideas are encapsulated by carrying the weight of life, then someone who fights for the opposite of this cannot hear and reciprocate those ideals. Those words won't reach them. Specifically here, I'm talking about this song's usage in relation to N, a person who repeatedly refuses to listen and understand what he's being told, thus he completely counters everything Ouroboros fights for. We see this in narrative, evidently, where N is a version of Noah who, as a result of his own past failures as an Ouroboros, resigned himself to the Endless Now, and is buried so deep in regret that he ignores reality and steeps himself in self-delusion. Not only is this song thematically opposed, it's musically opposed also. Now, I don't know enough music terminology to explain this properly, but basically, words that never reached you is like a fucked up carrying the weight of life. Never mind, that's definitely the correct terminology. I'll play some examples of similar phrasing and progression and stuff and see if you can hear it for yourself. The song is introduced and permeated by this echoing empty noise, an expression of those thoughts and ideas that failed to get through. This is what those words sound like to someone who adamantly will not listen or understand. As is the case for carrying the weight of life, a lot of this song prominently features those same mournful violins, as if to convey how one can be too enraptured and caught up with the melancholy of the world to change it whether out of resentment or resigning themselves to hopelessness. Those drums that were a driving motivator previously now become a monotonous steady beat, reflecting no sense of change or progression, just the steady, unchanging present. In the background, there's a distant electric guitar. That loud, confident, melodic voice from before has become an unrecognizable, confused mess that later warbles out a pained, sorrowful phrase. And, most significantly and indicative out of everything, there's no flute to be heard at all in this song. 
Noah and Mio have no opportunity to communicate with N, and there is no consideration given to the voices of the departed. This is a super cool parallel to me. N and Noah are diametrically opposed, as are their regret and hope, and this is reflected musically. For me, this by proxy elevates both songs and cements Carrying the Weight of Life as one of my favourite pieces of music ever. All in all, Carrying the Weight of Life is a song that expresses the will of Ouroboros, their collective desire to create a better kind of future in place of the cruelty and unfairness of the endless now. The reverence for the sanctity of life is expressed beautifully and intertwines with the desires to create the change needed for a world that is fundamentally respectful of those lives. This is just one example of how this game's thematic framework is utilised across both narrative and music to great effect, making the story being told more emotionally resonant as well. Hey, so that's my analysis of Carrying the Weight of Life. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I genuinely love this song so much, and I was just motivated by like this overwhelming passion for this song, and Xenoblade 3 as a whole, really, that I just wanted to express it somewhere and share some of my love for this song with others. That's been my first attempt at making like a video essay style thing. Um, I really enjoyed making it. I really do like uh, doing like media analysis writing type stuff, um, and putting the video together was quite fun as well. Uh, even though it took me quite a while to finish, um, but hopefully I'll get better about that for next time, but maybe not, who knows. Um, I think even with regards to Xenoblade 3 specifically, there's a lot more I could talk about. Um, it's a really interesting game thematically, and I think there's a very strong uh, Marxist reading you could do of the game, where Mobius is the ruling class and they're benefiting off the cycles of abuse and exploitation they put everyone through uh, as a metaphor for late stage capitalism. Uh, so I think that would be really interesting to talk about. Uh, but beyond that, there's a bunch of other games and uh, films and music and other stuff I'd love to discuss um, in this kind of style. So yeah, um, if you made it all the way through this video, thank you so much for watching. Uh, I hope you found something of value in it. Um, it was really fun to make, like I said. Uh, so hopefully you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed making it. That makes sense. Also, while I'm here, I'd like to say there's a full list of sources in the description for visual assets that I used for this video. Uh, and also, most importantly, thank you to my amazing girlfriend, Monica. I love her so much. She's so awesome. Uh, she helped give me a lot of advice when I asked for it uh, with regards to stuff I did during editing and stuff. Um, and I can't thank her enough for it. She's so awesome. Uh, you can check her out here, uh, and you definitely should, because she's really, really cool. Um, but yeah, that'll do it for me. Uh, so thank you again, and I hope you have a good rest of your day, and I'll uh, see you later.